On December 21st, 1946, Eugene Talmadge died. Of course, it's a tragedy when anyone dies, but Eugene Talmadge's death raised a particular problem because he had just won the election to become the governor of the state of Georgia. And although it sounds more like a dynastic crisis from the Middle Ages, almost immediately several other men claimed to have the right to become governor, including Talmadge's son. As New Year rolled in, in January 1947, the state of Georgia had a problem. It had three governors. It is history that deserves to be remembered. By the election of 1946, Eugene Talmadge had been involved in Georgia politics for at least 20 years. He was elected agricultural commissioner in 1926, where he built a base of support among rural white voters. He had a reputation for corruption and nepotism. He admitted to a scheme to steal government funds in an attempt to raise the price of hogs, telling farmers, sure I stole it, but I stole it for you. He was regularly criticized for hiring family members and paying them exorbitant salaries, for using government funds to finance trips to horse races, and the legislature found he broke the law by refusing to put fertilizer fees in the state treasury. He was also famously and unabashedly racist. According to one Georgia historian, it's fair to say he was one of the most virulently racist governors the state has ever had. His son Herman later said that Eugene despised peace and harmony. Eugene Talmadge was governor for two two-year terms in 1932 and 1934, and a third term in 1940. He ruled by causing trouble, declared martial law to get his way 17 times. Because of a constitutional amendment passed in 1908 that barred 95% of African Americans from voting in the state, the Democratic Party held a vice-like grip over the state's politics and faced little opposition in the general election. Only the Democratic primary was hotly contested. Talmadge did run in the 1942 election, but lost to Ellis Arnold. One issue in the campaign was an embarrassing controversy over Talmadge's fight to prevent racial integration in Georgia's universities. Talmadge considered it a victory that Georgia's state-supported colleges lost their accreditation over anti-black policies. But the controversy likely cost him the election. While Arnold was governor, the term for the governorship was raised from two years to four years, but part of that legislation specifically barred Arnold from running for another term. The 1946 election presented Talmadge with a final opportunity to become governor. Talmadge was heavily critical of Roosevelt and what he saw as encroaching civil rights. He was especially fired up by the Supreme Court decision on Smith v. Allwright, which made it illegal for political parties to limit primary voters by race. That decision is the subject of another episode of The History Guy. Talmadge made the return of the white primary his central campaign issue. His family and his physician were against his running, saying that the campaign, fought throughout brutally hot summer months, would sap his strength and threaten his life. They hoped that he would step aside and allow his son and presumptive political heir, Herman, run instead. But Talmadge refused to not run, saying, I'm the only goddamn son of a bitch that can win. Talmadge represented the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, while Arnold, who had gotten rid of poll taxes, represented a progressive wing of Democrats who supported the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt. Talmadge would have had almost no chance of winning if not for Georgia's unique primary system. Instead of election by popular vote, they used an electoral college-like system that used county unit votes. The eight most populous were urban counties, worth six points. The next 30 were town counties, worth four, with the remaining 121 rural counties, worth two. The system massively overvalued the 121 rural counties, meaning that during the primary, most campaigning was done in the rural counties. To illustrate how, in the 1960 primary election, the rural counties represented only 32% of the popular vote, but 59% of the county unit votes. Talmadge was unpopular in the urban areas, but relied on his support among rural voters. The campaign was highly contested, and despite the warning about his health, Talmadge gave 272 speeches that summer. The primary itself was held on July 17, 1946. His most serious opponent was James Carmichael, a businessman and former state legislator. Carmichael won the popular vote, 313,000 to 297,000, over Talmadge won the county unit votes, 244 to 144. This virtually guaranteed Talmadge's victory in the general election, where he would go on to win 98% of the votes. But even before the election, there were troubling signs about Talmadge's health. On October 3rd, he started suffering from stomach hemorrhages that prevented him from attending the state Democratic Convention that month. He took a vacation trying to recover, but even he admitted that the election probably took years of his life. Concerns over what precisely would happen if he died before his inauguration swirled. 
November 15th, the Tampa Times reported that the official primary count was delayed in Georgia as Talmadge rumored too ill to serve. There were a number of reasons why it was such a significant issue for Georgia specifically. The state had just written a new constitution, ratified in August of 1945 by popular vote. The revision created the office of lieutenant governor, kind of vice presidential position which did not exist in the state previously. Melvin Thompson was elected alongside Talmadge as the state's first lieutenant governor. The 1945 Constitution, however, did not specifically say what happened if the governor died before taking office. The Constitution also said that if no person shall have such a majority, then from the two persons having the highest number of votes who shall be in life shall be elected by the General Assembly. To complicate matters further, the Constitution also said that the governor served for four years and until his successor shall be chosen and qualified. This implied that if a successor could not be chosen and qualified, the sitting governor remained in office. Suddenly, the votes that the other candidates had gotten in the general election became very important, even though they only represented some 1.5% of the total vote. The Talmadge people seemed to have created a contingency plan from the start, just in case Eugene Talmadge were to win the election but not survive long enough to make it to the inauguration. They began a writing campaign for his son Herman in secret. According to the official register, Herman came in second place with 675 votes, with James Carmichael, who had lost in the primary third at 669 votes, and Republican Talmadge Bowers trailing with 637 votes. There was, however, a more serious issue with the reported totals involving the Talmadge's home county of Telfair. Besides the most important offices, Telfair didn't even bother reporting totals for most offices. Other totals seemed to have been simply copy and pasted, except for one. An Atlanta Journal reporter noted that despite remarkable consistency in the vote totals, Telfair recorded 49 more votes for governor than any other office and 77 write-in votes for Herman Talmadge. The Telfair Enterprise reported a different total, giving Herman only 29 votes and only one vote more than the other offices. Somehow, 48 votes seemed to have appeared from nowhere, all in the single precinct which had only counted 103 votes. The most damning evidence of fraud came from the precinct's sign-in sheets. The last 34 voters there arrived, astonishingly, in alphabetical order, with names from A to K. The reporter found that most of those names, all but two, seemed to not have voted in 1946 at all. Three of them were dead. Other counties' reports for Herman write-ins seem similarly suspicious. The Talmadge organization brushed off the accusations, blaming them lying Atlanta newspapers. The total number of fraudulent votes for Herman was likely small, as he only received 675 votes statewide out of 145,000. But, of course, that was just enough to put him ahead of Carmichael with 669 and likely put him ahead of Bowers, too. Herman never admitted any knowledge of the affair, blaming possible fraud on friends. By November, Eugene Talmadge seemed to be recovering by eating a poached egg diet, but was back in the hospital after refusing to give up a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. He died on December 21st, 1946, just weeks before he would have been sworn in on January 13th. The cause of death was attributed to cirrhosis of the liver and hemolytic jaundice, likely brought on by years of heavy drinking. As the Sunday Star of Washington, D.C. put it, the Georgia Constitution provides no specific succession procedure. There were three people who claimed to have a constitutional claim to the governorship. Ellis Arnold claimed that he would remain governor until the situation was settled. Technically, he said, under the Constitution, I could remain in office four years longer. With heavy support in the legislature, Herman Talmadge relied on that portion of the Constitution that would send the election to the Assembly. Finally, Melvin Thompson, the lieutenant governor-elect, argued that he should become governor. Thompson had not run on a ticket with Talmadge and, in fact, was politically allied to Arnold. The Assembly faced significant lobbying from Talmadge and Thompson, with Talmadge attempting to rile up the public and Thompson claiming that he would only serve until a new election could be held in 1948. When the legislature convened on Tuesday, January 14th, the building was full of drunk Talmadge supporters, and the president of the Senate ineffectively banged his gavel for an hour trying to get them to leave. They were sitting in the legislators' seats. Once cleared, a series of proposals was thrown up by the battling parties. The legislators were drinking as hard as the people in the galleries, and the session extended into the night. One legislator had to be dragged back in off the lawn where he had passed out. Talmadge accused Thompson people of putting knockout drops in some legislators' drinks, and one legislator chased another with a knife, threatening to kill him. Bribes were large on both sides. Just before 2 a.m., however, Herman Talmadge was declared governor. He immediately took the oath of office. 
Talmadge marched to the governor's office, with his supporters literally beating down the locked doors. Herman insisted, however, that no violence be used to remove Arnold from the room, and his wishes prevailed. I presume that you have been informed that I have been elected governor by the General Assembly, Talmadge announced. Arnold replied that the General Assembly cannot elect a governor. I refuse to yield the office to you, whom I consider a pretender. Do you defy the General Assembly, Talmadge asked? No, but I uphold the law, said Arnold. As Talmadge left the office with his entourage in tow, Arnold called after him, You were nice to come in. Talmadge set up office in the reception room, while fighting between supporters broke out across the Capitol. Arnold left his office at 3.30 a.m., promising to return. The two sides battled for nearly two months. Time magazine opined that Georgia was getting more attention than a two-headed calf and seemed to suffer from the same ailments which harassed such a rare beast. Each of Georgia's heads want to go different directions, and each of them mooed incessantly. Fictional radio character Senator Beauregard Claghorn quipped that he had given a speech to a crowd that would fill two theaters, one of which was entirely filled with Georgia governors. On January 15th, Arnold held his office, while ten yards away in the reception room, Talmadge sat at the desk of Arnold's former executive secretary. Arnold had the state guard available while Talmadge had control of the National Guard. Everyone was wondering when the two sides were going to start shooting at each other, Talmadge said later. The next day, Talmadge got into the office before Arnold and had the locks changed. Arnold denied entry, set up office at the information desk in the Capitol Rotunda. The attorney general supported Arnold, and state business was in chaos. Someone threw a firecracker at Arnold, forcing him to retreat to his law offices, while someone else released tear gas in the governor's office. Herman Talmadge had essentially secured the governorship. Arnold and Lieutenant Governor Thompson went to the courts. Talmadge argued that the courts had no right to be involved due to the separation of powers. Arnold told reporters that he had been locked out of his office by stormtroopers. Protests on both sides racked the state. An Atlanta man tried to get away with bigamy, arguing in court that I can't see why it's wrong for a man to have two wives when a state can have two governors. Meanwhile, Thompson claimed that he would exercise the responsibilities as acting governor until such time as the people themselves may elect a governor. Both he and Talmadge appointed their own administrations. For two weeks, the state treasurer refused to recognize either appointed revenue commissioner. The court arguments reached the Supreme Court of Georgia on March 6, 1947. And on March 19th, in a 5-2 to two decision, the Georgia Supreme Court declared the Assembly's action illegal, saying that the Assembly should have declared Eugene Talmadge the winner and then let Thompson take over as lieutenant governor. The Assembly only had the right to choose a governor if the people didn't give anyone a majority. Thompson was made acting governor. Talmadge immediately vacated the office. But even after the decision, Talmadge seemed to believe that the people would make it known that they disagreed, and he and others argued that the court was being political, and perhaps he had a point, because in 1948, Herman Talmadge was elected governor. The controversy was a dramatic display, product of an unclear constitution, parts of which remained unchanged since 1824, as well as significant national politics and movements like World War II, civil rights, and landmark Supreme Court decisions. And while Herman Talmadge might have eventually lost in the 1947-3 governor's crisis, it actually was a win for the Talmadge side of the party. In fact, the 1946 election represented a significant setback for the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in Georgia. In the end, perhaps the greatest lesson to take from this is that despite all the obstacles and all the irregularities and all the incendiary politics, the three-governor crisis was still resolved with, well, at least not very much Bloodshed, one of the most contested and controversial elections in modern U.S. history, still resulted in a peaceful transition of power, giving us some, well, hope for the Republic, even in difficult times. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.